All right, thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, I want you to think about this. You were not designed to do life alone. God designed you for relationships. Now, by that, I do not mean that you have to be in a romantic relationship. You don't have to be married or dating someone in order to be in the will of God. In fact, we know that the Bible says that there are some people that have been given the gift of singleness, and, but yet God says that for us, for you, for me, that we are designed for human relationships. We're not supposed to do life alone. Now, not, uh, it doesn't mean that every person has to be married or in a romantic relationship, but that every person needs to interact and to have fellowship. That's the word, fellowship with other people. And for a Christian, we're to have fellowship with other Christians. In fact, I've learned over the years that for those people that do not have fellowship on a regular basis in the church, eventually stop going to church. It's almost inevitable, okay? Why? Because God designed you for relationships. But here's what we know. Uh, that if you're going to be in a relationship with anyone, it requires work. It requires patience. It requires forgiveness. It requires understanding. Are you with me on this? My very best friend, his name is Gene Wolfenbarger. He is a pastor in Tennessee, and he and I have been friends for over 35 years. And uh, years ago, when our kids were young, Gene and I, for some reason, I don't know why we got upset with each other, but we had uh, our, my family, Kim and our kids, and Gene's family, uh, his wife is Karen, and their kids were at Disney World. We're at Disney World, supposedly the happiest, happiest place on earth. And Gene and I, okay, this is once again a man of God, a pastor of a church. I, a man of God, a pastor of a church. We almost got in a fist fight in the parking lot of Disney World, the happiest place on earth. I don't even remember what we got upset over. Maybe the fact that we were spending so much money, maybe that was what we were upset over. But I do know that having a relationship with someone, having fellowship with someone, is not always easy. You got to be patient. You got to be willing to forgive. And you got to work at it. Kim and I have been married for 38 years. Now, I want to just let you know, let you know a secret. Uh, Kim and I got married. I was 21 years old when we got married. And for my first 21 plus years of life, I want you to know that never once, never once did I have a discussion about the importance of the position of the toilet seat in a house. Never did that come up. I grew up, my uh, dad and I shared a bathroom. We had two bathrooms in our house. My mom and my sister shared a bathroom. I had never even been in where the women's bathroom was and understood all the power tools and the gadgets and all. I didn't even know what some of that stuff was for to get ready, okay? Uh, in college, I lived in the dorm, okay? A disgusting place, all right? Never once did I have a discussion about the position of toilet seats and how important that is to a long-term marriage. Uh, when Kim and I were married not too long ago, one, uh, not too long, um, one night, in the middle of the night, I heard Kim scream to the top of her lungs. I thought somebody was attacking our house. I jumped up to defend my bride. I was ready to rumble, you know what I mean? And I discovered that Kim had fallen into the toilet, all right? And that was the reason for her screaming, okay? Now, let, let me help you, okay? I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not the dumbest either, okay? And it didn't take me very long to have a very deep and important and lasting, impactful discussion about how important it was to put down the toilet seat, okay? Okay? And I learned that that was one of the keys to marriage, okay? I didn't know that before, but I do now, all right? And uh, so, you know, Kim and I solved that problem. 
You say, did you learn to put the toilet seat down? No, we just got a house that has more than one bathroom, and we use separate bathrooms now, all right? So my, my point is this, that fellowship, relationships, requires work, requires understanding, it requires patience, it requires forgiveness. And, and if you are going to fellowship at a church, and I don't mean fellowship by just like eating together or watching football together or talking about the Braves. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fellowship that is meaningful, that will impact your Christian life, that will help you stay in the game, that will help you not quit church. I want you to think about this. Serving is fellowship at the highest level. I want you to, I'm going to say that again, because I don't say very many things that are profound, but this may be one of the things that I say occasionally that is profound, and I want you to let it sink in. Serving is fellowship at the highest level. I'm going to say it again, okay? Because you don't hear very many profound things in your life. Serving is fellowship at the highest level. And, and if you want to stay in the game, if you want not to quit, if you want to stay connected to the church, listen, serving is a very important key to that. It just is. But today I'm going to read uh, to you uh, one of the stories of Jesus, and, and in, in this story, he gives us a couple of um, paradoxes, and we're going to talk about those paradoxes, and there are many paradoxes that Jesus talked about in the Bible. For example, he said, if you want to gain your life, you got to lose it. Now, when you hear that the first time, you're like, that doesn't make sense. You want to gain your life? You got to guard it. But Jesus said, no, no, no. You want to gain your life? You want to find life? then give it away. And we all intrinsically know that to be true. Because the key to fulfillment, the key to happiness, the key to finding your purpose in the Christian life is not being narcissistic. It's not being all about yourself. It's about serving others. It's about other people. It's about giving away your life so that you can truly find life. And I think there are many people that would agree with that, that would say, you know what? I found life. I found fulfillment. I found happiness when I began to give my life away in the service of others. These are just one of the, well, this is just one of the paradoxes that Jesus talks about. What are some others? He says, uh, if you're going to get, you got to give. Now, once again, that doesn't seem to make sense, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if you're a parent, you know that to be true because uh, the thing about having children is that they are little narcissists. They are like little sponges that will soak up every resource that you can possibly give them. They are like completely self-absorbed. They are... High maintenance, we'll put it that way, okay? But if you've had children, you know how blessed it is. You know how wonderful it is. And once again, would you like for them to clean up their room sometimes without having been told? Yes. But the fact that you're able to have kids, you know that that is a gift from God. And so that illustrates that it's more blessed to give than to receive. We know this is true about the Christian life. We know this is true about giving. We know this is true about generosity. You want to get, you got to give. In fact, it goes a step further in tithing and giving. Here's what God says, that when you give, he's going to bless you. He's going to open up the windows of heaven for you so much. You want him to have room enough to receive it. And he says this, he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. So we know that you can't outgive God. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's one of those paradoxes, okay? Jesus said uh, that if uh, you want to be, uh, uh, if you want to be honored, 
you got to humble yourself. You want to be exalted, you got to humble yourself. And we know that to be true because how many of us have been around people that are self-serving, self-seeking? They want to just give you their resume every time you get in a conversation with them. They want to tell you how much they've done. They want to brag on all the things they've accomplished. Nobody likes hanging out with a person like that. And so we know this to be true. Well, uh, in the passage we're going to read today, Jesus talks about if you want to be first, you've got to be last. And if you want to be a leader, then you've got to be a servant. And this really talks about what we said, that serving is fellowship at the highest level. That if you're going to have fellowship, if you're going to develop relationships in the church, you must serve. Because this is what these two paradoxes are about. It's about serving God by serving others in the church. Well, let's read in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse number 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house talking about Jesus, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? He's asking his disciples. But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. <laughs> Busted, caught red handed Jesus knew what they were doing. He was drawing their attention to it. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone will be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives me. Not me, but him who sent me. Now, Jesus was using this as a teaching tool, as a metaphor to show us that if we will, he was not, you know, a lot of times people say, well, we got to be childlike faith. And, and I'm not completely throwing shade on that. I'm just saying that that's not really what Jesus was saying. Jesus was not saying to be like a child, but rather he was saying to be like him. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, if you want to understand what I'm doing, why? Because in that culture, children were, it's not that people didn't love their children, but children didn't have a voice. Children were not considered significant. Um, it was, I mean, there was a very high infant mortality rate, and it was just a completely different way of looking at life, because uh, kids, how many of you grew up with a parent or grandparents that said, you are to be seen but not heard. Anybody have that, all right, growing up? How many of you, your mom or your dad, would beat the ever-living daylights out of you if you went to a, a, a friend's house, uh, visiting someone's house, and you decided on your own that you were going to go through the refrigerator without permission? Anybody have a parent? The, my mother, I would not be alive today, all right, if I had done that. Okay, it was more old school in those days when it came to children, okay? So Jesus, in taking this child and taking this child into his arms, he was showing that, yes, children are important, and yes, children's ministry is important, but what he was really showing is that the, the ones that society looks at as the most insignificant, I love. They're important to me. They're important to God. And though... Society may not think they're important. God does. And this tells us that people matter to God. And it doesn't matter how talented or untalented you may be, how smart or not smart you may be. God loves people. Okay? And, and so this is uh, something that Jesus was teaching and showing us that it's very important that we serve one another, that we serve. Remember, Serving is fellowship at the highest level. You want deep, deep um, uh, relationships that last. Be willing to serve. Don't be selfish. Don't be narcissistic. Be willing to put others first. You see, uh, even people that don't really believe that the Bible is God's word, which I hope you do, I certainly do, even people that wonder about that 
they have to admit that these things that Jesus said were profound and they're true at the deepest level. And so I just want to give you in the next few minutes three ways that Jesus tells us to serve, okay? You want to be able to develop this relationship with others, there are three things you got to do. Number one, serve humbly. Be humble about it. He said, if anyone will be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now, the disciples were arguing about what? They were arguing about status and privilege and greatness. And they were comparing. Let me just say this. If you get caught up in comparison, the comparison game, you're going to lose. Not only are you going to find somebody that's better at something than you are, but you lose morally and spiritually and emotionally because you can't hold up. You are not supposed to compare your life, your opportunity with someone else's. You see, God created them. And God created you. And he has a purpose for them. And he has a purpose for you. That's why he gave you the gifts and talents and experiences and opportunities that you have had. And he gave that other person gifts and opportunities and talents and experiences. And what he wants us to do is to use it in his service. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. And he said this, and this is a quote. He said, it is comparison that makes you proud. It is not necessarily pride to think that you are rich or clever or good looking, but it is pride to boast in being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. And he goes on, he says, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. And so don't get caught up in the comparison game, but serve humbly, humbly. Pride keeps us from God. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So you want to be exalted? You want to get honored? You want to have a good reputation with others in the church and the community? Well, then be humble about it. Humility does not seek recognition or position. It put other, puts others first and honors those who deserve it. By the way, the Bible does not say that it's wrong to honor people. There's nothing wrong with being honored for something you've done if you deserve it, okay? The Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And I really do believe that if we would practice more honor in our culture, in our society, that it'd be much better off. Well, be humble. Here's the second thing. Embrace servant leadership. You say, what is that? Well, that's what Jesus was saying, that if you want to be the leader, you got to be the servant. You got to put others' needs ahead of your own. Let me show you what servant leaders do. They prioritize service above status. If you're more concerned about status than you are actually serving other people, then you got it backwards. Uh, servant leaders prioritize, prioritize service above convenience. God knows there have been many times in my life that it hasn't been convenient to serve it hasn't been convenient to be faithful. It hasn't been convenient to lead. But God calls us to that, does he not? So servant leaders prioritize service above comfort. Um, welcoming people and reaching people can be uncomfortable. I want you to understand that's why we say uh, that, you know, reaching people wherever they are and bringing them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we say this is the perfect place for imperfect people. That's why we say participation. Participation is church membership. Why? Because we want you to understand that even when it gets messy, that's why we say we embrace the mess, that it's worth it. Why? Because God loves people and so should we. Servant leaders prioritize service because they love God. Do you know that 
we get this from the words of Jesus. He, he gave us the great commandment when he said, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbors yourself. We are to love people, and we serve people because we love God. That's the bottom line. We don't do it for status or recognition or convenience, but we do it because we love God. Now, Romans 14, 1 says, welcome people who are weak in faith, but don't get into argu an argument over differences of opinion. I think that what happens in many churches is that, yes, people come together and they begin to serve God. They begin to grow in their faith. They begin to learn more and more about the Bible. And if you're not careful, the more you grow, the less you're going to be concerned about outsiders. In fact, we can become wall builders. We build walls between us and people that need to be reached. But here's what the Apostle Paul said. Welcome people who are weak in the faith. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have somebody that doesn't even know for sure if they believe in the existence of God come and pastor the church or preach the word of God that they're not even sure they believe. That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about in our relationships and in the church, welcome people. And he says, but don't get caught up in arguing over differences of opinion. You know, a lot of what we get so upset over in our culture today is just merely that, a difference of opinion. It's not, it's not absolute truth. It's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just that you've got a different opinion than I do. And that's okay. Servant leaders are rewarded. The Bible tells us that uh, when you do something as simple as give a cup of water in the name of Jesus, you'll receive a reward and then servant leaders reach people wherever they are. Talking about wherever the people are. And so that's what God has called us to do. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 says, This is how one should regard us. This is the Apostle Paul. Okay, The one responsible for starting more churches. The one that's indirectly responsible for the gospel being brought to North America. And uh, by extension to this area, and by extension to this church. We owe a lot to the Apostle Paul. Here's what he said. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, what is a steward? It's a person responsible for what someone else gives them. So he says, I am to be seen as a servant and a steward. And that's my job. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Now, let me uh, help you with this. I think this will be a help to you. The word servant in that passage that I just read, uh, it describes, here's what it describes, a subordinate, a helper, or an assistant. A subordinate, a helper, or an assistant. Now, it was willing service. This is what you need to understand. This was not slavery. This was not coerced service. This was not commanded service. This was a person that was willing to give service. They did it because of their love. They did it because they loved the person they were serving. Okay? And the word is derived from a term, I want you to get this, that means under rower. You say, what in the world does that mean? What is an under rower? Well, in that day, every person reading this would, un would know exactly what they were talking about because maybe you've read about it in books or maybe you've seen it on old movies. Uh, you know how in some of those old, old ships, it wouldn't have a sail. Uh, this was before steam engines and before any of that. But what it would have was a bunch of people underneath the top deck, and they would have an oar. And there would be a lot of them, and they would literally move the ship because they rowed together. Now I want you to get this. Here's what Paul said that you and I need to have the attitude of an under rower. We're not worried about being on the top deck. We're not worried about who recognizes us. We're worried about the destination. We're worried about putting our hand to the oar and not giving up. Because when we give up, guess what? 
somebody else has got to take up the slack. And when we stop rowing, somebody else's job gets much harder, okay? And what God wants you and me to understand is that our job, our calling, is to be an under rower. Put your hand to the oar and be a servant leader. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? This is what God wants for you and me. And then I wrap it up with this, and, I, and I'm closing here. Number three, uh, we're talking about three ways you can serve the Lord, three ways you can be involved, three ways that fellow, service is fellowship at the highest level. The third thing is this. Be great at the things that matter to God. Now, you can be great at a lot of things that don't matter. There are some people that are. And look, I love sports, and I love watching sports. I love reading about sports. In fact, every morning, somewhere after 4.30 in the morning, because I get up early, uh, I have a cup of coffee, and I'm going to read ESPN.com. Not the whole thing, but like, you know, just the things that I'm interested in. Because I like sports, okay? I go to uh, InsideCarolina.com. I go to uh, TarHeels.com because I'm a North Carolina Tar Heel fan. So there's about three websites that I go to every day that I'll read. Why? Because I'm a sports fan. But can I be honest? There are a lot of things that I read about that aren't that important. I mean, it really isn't. Now, I don't mean to get into sacrilege here, okay? But how the Georgia Bulldogs do this year in football is not really, in the grand scheme of things, that big of a deal. Now, I know that it's important to some, not to all of our Georgia Tech grads, but nevertheless, what I want you to get is you can be good at things that don't matter. Or you can be good at things that greatly matter to God. And that's what he's called us to. Jesus told us to receive children. And once again, he was not telling us to be childlike. He was telling us to be like him. He was telling us to be good at the things that really matter to God. Greatness in God's eyes is not reserved for the gifted or the privileged or the wealthy. It is reserved for the true servant. Service to others is the primary way that believers imitate Jesus and fulfill the mission of Jesus. Think about that again, okay? Uh, service to others is the primary way. It's not a way. It's not just a good way. It's the primary way, according to the Bible. It's the main way. It's the most important way that you can differentiate yourself from a person that doesn't even know God, doesn't even love God, doesn't even care about the things of God, and a person that truly does love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind. You want to be that person? You want to live life that way? Then Jesus said there's a key, and it's to serve God by serving others. And that's our call. Heavenly Father, help us to live this out. Lord, this is so important. And yet, Lord, so many times we, we forget because uh, we get so busy and uh, we just kind of let things fall by the wayside. But Lord, help us to realize that serving is fellowship at the highest level. And that is the way that we can differentiate our lives from someone who doesn't love God and show that we truly do love God with all of our heart and soul and mind. Now, before I pray, I wonder if you would say, Pastor Richie, I need prayer today. Maybe you need prayer for salvation. Maybe you would like to say something like this in a prayer to God. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross, that you rose from the grave, and I'm asking you to come into my life and to save me, to change me. I'm giving myself completely to you. And if you'll say that prayer, then mark on your card that you will receive Christ today. You can drop it in the offering bucket in just a moment. Or maybe today you'd say, Pastor, you know, God's been speaking to me about serving. I don't know where to get started. Well, you know where a good place to start is? 
an easy place to start, a great first step. You don't have to stay here, and it's not the only place to serve. But you can get involved in guest services. And here's how you do that. In a moment, drop that next step card in the offering and put your name on there and put guest services. Anybody can do this. Everybody can be involved. Everybody can do something. And so I want to challenge you to step up, to step up. Father, help us today to serve you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. In just a moment, our ushers are going to come and drop your next step card in the offering as it passes. There are other ways that you can get involved in giving. Uh, you can give in the bucket when it's passed by check or cash. Uh, you can give by uh, texting 84321, 84321. You can go to stillwaters.online, give online, or you can give with the app, okay? And this is a tremendous way to give. That's the way Kim and I give, and uh, it's a way for you to be involved, all right? Don't forget now, we're taking up an offering every week, and we've got a few more weeks of this, okay? So if you haven't given, make a plan to give. I don't care if all you can give is $5. I think everybody that comes to this church needs to give something. Everybody. You say, are you trying to put pressure on us? Absolutely, all right? You saw right through me, okay? I'm not encouraging. I'm not saying this would be a great idea. I'm not saying I'm going to tickle you as you walk out if, uh, if you do this. No. What I'm saying is every person that goes to our church needs to give something. Why? Because we're helping children halfway across the world whose parents died of HIV-related disease, some of whom were found, they thought, dead in a field before our team rescued them and brought them to the children's village in South Africa. They've grown up and gotten saved and baptized, and they're getting ready to go out into the world and make a difference for Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of that. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. You say, well, I don't know if my $5 or my $20 or my $100 will make a difference. It would. It does. And I really believe this. When we stand before God one day, you're going to know, you're going to find out how much impact your participation made. And so I want everybody, you know, and you don't have to do it today. We've got a few more weeks, but I encourage you to do that, okay? All right. Uh, don't forget, ushers, let's go ahead and come now, uh, and you can pass those. While they're passing those buckets, drop in your next step cards. Uh, if you have got a prayer request, no matter what it is, uh, put it in there if you want to sign up for guest services. Put that on there if you want to be saved or join the church or uh, whatever. You take that next step on there today. And then don't forget, next Sunday is Father's Day. Father's Day. You know what I'm asking for for Father's Day? I only ask one thing. This is it. You might want to emulate this. I'm asking my kids to be in church with me. Now, my kids, some of them all live around here close, but I don't care about them buying me a tie or a shirt or gift. You know what I care about? I want them to be in church with me on that Sunday. Maybe that would be something you would ask. You say, would you put guilt on your kids to get them in church? Absolutely, I would. And you shouldn't be afraid to do that either. You say, why? Uh, you don't believe we should put guilt on people, do you? It works. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so get them here. Uh, but that'll be next Sunday. And so uh, we're all, uh, all ready to go. All right. So thank you for being here today.